I work at Blood System Research Institute, and I'm going to give you the perspective of a research institute focused on um, the safety of blood transfusion. And so we are going to speak about Zika and how we can gain insights into the natural history of Zika virus infection in humans from the studies of uh, blood donors. Why are we speaking about blood donors? because uh, they are the best source of samples when we want to address the early events of the acute phase of infection, uh, especially in case of emerging infectious disease. So the way we responded uh, to the emergence of Zika virus was to uh, capitalize on blood bank resources and pre-existing network of collaborators. And so we were able to rapidly gain access to samples to evaluate detection tools uh, to design a multifaceted study that were submitted as grants to the NIH uh, to collect samples in order to gain insights into Zika virus epidemiology, infectivity, and pathogenesis. And as part of all of our studies, we are building a comprehensive uh, repositories of samples to be shared with the wider uh, scientific community. But before I start, I will give you a little bit of background on Zika virus. I'm sure you're uh, most aware of uh, what was uh, going on. Uh, so Zika virus was first isolated in 1947 in Uganda uh, from the blood of uh, a sentinel rhesus monkey that was placed in the Zika forest uh, in 1947, and then uh, from mosquito pools of Aedes mosquitoes in 1948, and from uh, human blood in 1954 in Nigeria. And so the virus uh, moved uh, westward within Africa, and we know also from several surveys uh, in East Africa that the virus was present. And we also know that the, present was, uh, the virus was present in Asia in the 50s and throughout the 60s, 70s. So we didn't hear about Zika virus until uh, the Yap Island outbreak in 2007, uh, which was characterized by a high incidence of clinical disease and a high uh, attack rate in the population as up to 75% of the population may have been exposed to the virus. And then uh, the virus reached uh, French Polynesia and was responsible for an outbreak in 2013 and 14 where for the first time there was a, a, an association with Guillain-Barré syndrome. So that's a more severe uh, outcome. And then the virus reached Brazil, and in 2015 the first cases of microcephaly in newborns were reported. The virus ran, uh, spread uh, northward to, through Latin America and is present in the Caribbean. So what is Zika virus? Zika virus is a flavivirus like West Nile, dengue, Japanese encephalitis, yellow fever, and the strains of Zika virus that are emerging throughout the Americas are from the Asian uh, lineage. What is the transmission cycle? Well, it's between, uh, in the sylvatic uh, cycle, it's between monkeys and mosquitoes, and the urban cycle is between humans through uh, the vector Aedes mosquito. When we look at the distribution of the uh, Zika mosquito vector, mostly Aedes aegypti throughout the tropic area and Aedes albopictus, which is a little bit more spread northward and southward. But uh, we need to be uh, careful because Zika can be transmitted by other uh, Aedes um, mosquitoes. So looking at the uh, disease clinical outcomes, well, in 80% of the cases, the infection is asymptomatic. And in 20% of the cases, there is this mild form of symptom that is very difficult to distinguish from a dengue or chikungunya infection. We now know that um, the, the symptoms related, the mild form of symptoms related to Zika may include, on top of uh, fever and uh, uh, body aches, uh, a rash, a retroorbital pain, conjunctivitis, edema, hematospermia. But this is not too bad. When it becomes uh, worse is uh, when we look at the uh, history of the recent uh, infections, we know that the, 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 the virus can spread very fast. Uh, in French Polynesia, the first cases of Guillain-Barré syndromes were reported. We also know uh, that 2.8% of the blood donor population, that's kind of representing the general population, uh, was uh, positive for Zika RNA, so they were viremic for uh, Zika. It was circulating in the population. And uh, in Brazil, when the first cases of Zika were confirmed in May, 
we kind of got alerted because uh, we knew from the French Polynesia outbreak that Zika could be bad. However, the Guillain-Barré syndrome um, association was confirmed in July and then later in December. But what was the worst was uh, the report of uh, microcephaly cases uh, in areas where the virus had circulated, especially in the northeast of Brazil. And so looking at the uh, news in Brazil and discussing with our uh, Brazilian collaborators, the uh, number of microcephaly cases were reported by the hundreds and by the thousands uh, in between uh, December 2015 through uh, April 2016. And so that was really concerning. There was some debate on the association and whether or not Zika was responsible for this uh, very severe outcome uh, in newborns. Uh, so with more than now uh, 7,000 cases of microcephaly that were suspected, more than uh, 1,000 that were confirmed true microcephaly cases, and uh, over uh, 200 were showing evidence of Zika virus, uh, these, these um, cases are just the tip of the iceberg because that's the, the most obvious outcome and the worst uh, outcome, but we also expect that there will be a, a spectrum of neurologic disorders associated with um, uh, Zika virus infection during pregnancy. So we went from a confined outbreak on the Yap Island to a limited but warning outbreak in French Polynesia. And Didier Musso did a good job at alerting the scientific and medical uh, community that this thing was bad. And then we had this explosive outbreak in Brazil with the very uh, concerning uh, disease outcome of uh, microcephaly newborns. So now considering uh, the, the intensity of exchange uh, throughout the world and between South America, North America, and Europe, considering that several hundreds of uh, travel associated cases of Zika were imported in the US and in Europe, considering that the mosquito vector is present on half of the uh, US territory and in uh, other areas in the, in the world, knowing that a sexual transmission has been documented, we think that there's a strong potential for emergence elsewhere in the world, including the US and Europe. So now we got interested in uh, Zika virus because of the evidence for potential transfusion transmission. And so, um, as I mentioned, on the Yap Island, there was a high attack rate. In uh, the French Polynesia outbreak, there was 2.8% of the asymptomatic blood donor population that shows signs of viremia. And in Brazil, there were several uh, potential cases of transfusion transmission that were reported. So uh, as a research institute focused on uh, the safety of blood transmission, of blood transfusion, uh, we, uh, we reacted and uh, uh, we decided to uh, work on this virus. So we are uh, a division of Blood Systems Inc., which is the second largest nonprofit blood banking organization in the US. And the mission of uh, BSI is to produce a safe and ample blood supply to advance uh, cutting edge research. And BSRI is responsible for the research and policy development for BSI. And indeed, there is a risk associated with Zika virus transmission through uh, blood transfusion as the uh, infection is asymptomatic in 80% of the cases. So the blood donors may be uh, infected, but they feel perfectly fine and they come to donate blood. The pre-symptomatic period varies from three to 12 days. So even if they feel fine and uh, it may take a few days to develop some symptoms before they uh, report it and the blood product may be released in the meantime. The viremia is pretty high. It's been reported ranging from 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 7 copies per ml. And uh, we know that uh, in case of outbreak, the virus circulates uh, in the population uh, with several uh, cases of transfusion transmission in Brazil. And we know also that there is a transmission through uh, intrauterine, perinatal, and sexual transmission that has been reported. So the way we responded to the Zika emergence was, well, first we were alerted by Didier Musso in June 2015 that this thing was bad. Uh, we worked with him to gain access to the Zika virus uh, isolates from French Polynesia, I started to amplify the virus and characterize our virus stock uh, to launch animal models, studies in animal models. 
and uh, we uh, started to work on uh, RT-PCR uh, at BSRI and discussing with other testing labs um, and discussing with blood screening companies as well. So when the FDA released the guidelines uh, to uh, recommend uh, that ac uh, areas with active transmission of Zika virus stop the collection of uh, blood, uh, import blood from non-active transmission areas unless the blood was screened and uh, there was no sc uh, blood screening assay available at the time or uh, the platelets and plasma had to be pathogen inactivated. So that was in March. And in April, we are very grateful to Roche uh, to come up with a blood screening assay that could be implemented under uh, investigational new drug in Puerto Rico. And uh, contingent to the implementation of this blood screening, we were awarded uh, extra money through the Red 3 contract to, uh, through the uh, NHLBI, uh, National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, to look at the natural history of uh, the Zika RNA positive blood donors that were picked up by uh, blood screening. So indeed, we can gain insight into Zika epidemiology, infectivity, and pathogenesis from studies of blood donors, capitalizing on blood bank resources. And uh, as soon as we have a screening assay that is implemented, we can track the presence of the virus in the blood supply. We can enroll Zika RNA positive blood donors into uh, follow-up studies to sample, collect samples and characterize the samples in a consistent manner to understand the kinetics of viremia, immune response, and with access to symptom data, pathogenesis. And also we collect samples in the acute phase of infection from viremic donors uh, that, so that's very important. Uh, those ve very important samples can be uh, placed in long-term repository and be shared with the wider scientific community. So uh, specifically, this study has uh, for him to enroll 130 Zika viremic donors from Puerto Rico into longitudinal follow-up studies. We will collect symptom data and samples, including blood, saliva, urine, and semen and will characterize the natural history, persistence, and pathogenesis of Zika infection in humans. We are mostly interested in looking at the relative persistence in body fluids versus blood compartments, the dynamic of viremia and antibody development, because that will inform screening and diagnostic strategies. And we are building a comprehensive repository of samples, of course, that will enable the optimization of nucleic acid testing and serology-based assays and also future immunological studies to identify markers of infection and predictive markers of disease outcome. This study is to be launched in June, so very soon. The enrollment will run through the arbovirus season in Puerto Rico until December 2016, with a six months follow-up until June 2017. And so the Zika RNA positive blood donors will be identified through blood screening using the roche cobas Zika test under uh, investigational new drug application. They will be offered to participate in a research study with symptom data and sample collected at five follow-up visits. And all the samples will flow through BSRI in San Francisco, where different type of material will be placed in the repositories, including plasma, packed blood cells, PBMC, tempus tubes, urine, saliva, and semen. But also, these samples will be accessed to look at the dynamics of viremia, antibody development, and persistence in body fluids. So we have a lot of experience running this type of studies. We did in the past uh, the similar study for West Nile virus, enrolling West Nile virus RNA positive blood donors from the US, as well as dengue RNA positive blood donors in collaboration with the American Red Cross in Puerto Rico. And what we can gain from uh, these studies is based on our experience with other flavivirus, West Nile and dengue, and uh, the body of literature that is now coming up, we can expect that Zika virus viremia will be short. Like for West Nile, we would expect that the viremia would resolve uh, within a week or 10 days, depending on, on the sensitivity of the screening assay, uh, and before the uh, development of antibodies. And this is also confirmed uh, 
from the data we get on the uh, macaque studies, we are uh, performing in collaboration with Dr. Van Rompe and Kofi at uh, UC Davis at the California National Primate Research Center, where we can see that in macaque the varimia uh, lasts uh, five days and uh, peak around the second day post inoculation. Now, what do we expect in terms of uh, seroconversion and antibody development? Well, from our past studies in uh, Puerto Rico on dengue, we know that the population, uh, the vast majority of the population in Puerto Rico has pre-existing immunity to dengue. And so in case of secondary dengue infection, what we see is just a bump of IgG titers. And uh, when there is an IgM seroconversion, the titers uh, kind of wane down within a, a 60 days period. So it's a short uh, IgM response. And uh, interestingly, in five to 10% of the secondary dengue infection, there is no IgM seroconversion. So now the question is, is Zika close enough to dengue to increase the titers of uh, anti-dengue IgGs without IgM seroconversion? And that will be very interesting to know because it will have implication for uh, Zika diagnostics. Also, I, I shown in the past that uh, usually you look at the varemia in plasma. But uh, the flavivirus, like West Nile and dengue, may compartmentalize, and uh, the RNA can be found uh, persisting in the whole blood, maybe in the packed blood cell compartment, uh, up to three months uh, post indexonation for West Nile, and uh, persist also at a lower extent for dengue, but you can find degree of persistence in all blood compared to plasma. So we'll be very interested in uh, characterizing Zika RNA persistence in blood compartments and relative to urine, saliva, and semen persistence. That will inform screening and diagnostic approaches. Another thing we are interested in is identifying markers of disease outcome. So with access to uh, symptoms around uh, index donation and over the acute phase of infection, we can classify our donors as asymptomatic or symptomatic, and we like to compare the viral and immune parameters between asymptomatic and symptomatic donors to identify the parameters leading to the development of symptoms. And we like to reach out to collaborators who have access to samples collected from severe disease outcome cases. Across those groups, we like to uh, compare the dynamics of varemia and antibody development, the cellular response, the inflammatory profile, the host immune response at the gene expression level, and we want to identify markers associated with viral persistence and eventually inform diagnostic and therapeutic approaches. So on West Nile, the, our research informed that um, West Nile virus symptoms are mostly driven by immunopathogenesis. We showed in the past that asymptomatic donors have higher level of regulatory T cells. They may have a higher anti-inflammatory response, or maybe they better control their immune response. While symptomatic have higher level of exhausted T cells. So it's maybe a combination of higher inflammation and lower quality of immune response that may lead to symptoms development. Interesting also, uh, the immune modulation associated with pathogenesis is slightly different from the one associated with viral persistence. So this is the example of West Nile looking uh, in blue at the down regulation of cytokines and uh, in red the up regulation of cytokines. So we are looking at pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory cytokines, growth factor and chemoattractants. Uh, a different time point uh, post index in people who have early clearance versus delayed clearance in all blood, and uh, looking within both groups at those who are going to remain asymptomatic or develop symptoms. And what we see is that there is a, a rapid clearance that requires inflammation. So if you want to get rid of the virus fast, you need inflammation. That's uh, so far, uh, we understand that. However, excessive inflammation leads to symptoms. But interestingly, uh, you may have persistence without development of symptoms, so you remain asymptomatic, and eventually you will clear the virus. So maybe for West Nile, at least, it's not that bad to have persistence. You don't have symptoms, and everything is fine. However, it will be very interesting to compare. So the similar, similar studies can be conducted for Zika, and it will be very interesting to compare the data across different cohorts. I believe the, the meat of the, the, the research here is to understand 
uh, why the, 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 the pregnancy context, we know that the immunological context during pregnancy is slightly different and may allow uh, more persistence or a, a lower tolerance, a higher tolerance, sorry. So we'll see in uh, obstetric cohorts how uh, the viral persistence and inflammatory response may differ from uh, the, the response we see in blood donors or in uh, normal um, adult symptomatic cases and uh, from the uh, animal models. I believe that it's very important to identify predictive markers of newborn infection and congenital disease to inform decision of pregnancy interruption when it's allowed. So to summarize, I think the key areas of investigation that we'll st this study will touch is to better understand disease outcome, the rate of disease outcome depending on pre-existing immunity to dengue in dengue endemic versus non-endemic areas, to develop better screening and diagnostic tools, including higher sensitivity uh, nucleic acid testing assays, uh, higher specificity for serology-based assays, and maybe use the host immune response as markers of uh, predictive markers. The goal is to intervene, to prevent transmission, to predict disease outcome, and of course to prevent the severe disease outcome. For that, the research will have to be coordinated and there will be a, a crosstalk uh, in between uh, investigators who have, have access to different human cohorts and animal models. And of course, you need to use uh, the proper diagnostic tools in all of these cohorts. And to do that, uh, you need to have access to samples. Of course, considering the severity of the outcome and the rapid spread of Zika, uh, we would like to have the maximum of, of information as fast as possible. So with that, I'm going to analyze a lot of people through uh, the, the West Nile dengue research and this new uh, Zika uh, research that is uh, exploring the same network of collaborators. So uh, all my colleagues at uh, Blood System Research Institute at Creative uh, Testing Solution, at the BSI Medical Affairs, ongoing long-term collaborators, uh, Susan Strammer, Mike Diamond, Lee Shen Lovu, Esper Callas, Kristen Bernard, Maria Rios, especially Esther Sabino in Brazil, who has been a great help uh, working on this uh, emerging infectious uh, agent, and uh, collaborators at the UC Davis, Ken Van Rompe, Lark Coffey, at the CDC, Jorge Munoz, Rob Lanciotti, at Roche, Susan Garel, Tony Hardiman, Lisa Pates, Ologic, Jeff Linen, Vanessa Bress, and uh, our collaborators at Banco de Sangre in Puerto Rico, the UBS network, and One Blood Florida, and the Oversight Committee, the Red Free Zika Oversight Committee, as this study is uh, attracting a lot of uh, scrutiny from the CDC, the FDA, and uh, the NHLBI, and funding from uh, the NHLBI to support all of this research. Yes, yeah, so there are several uh, studies showing that there may be a potential for antibody enhancement, uh, antibody dependent enhancement uh, with, uh, from pre existing immunity to dengue. So uh, I think at this stage, uh, it's only in vitro studies, and uh, more evidence will have to be uh, built to ascertain this, uh, this evidence. Uh, but it's very important to understand that for now, Zika has been circulated in uh, dengue endemic areas, and so it's very difficult to evaluate what is the contribution of the pre existing immunity to dengue relative to uh, a regular uh, infection in, in, in non endemic uh, area. Hi, Marion. Um, I thought the uh, cytokine slide was really interesting on one style virus. Um, do you think the delayed, uh, the persistence of the virus is mostly linked to uh, viral titers at the start of infection so that it would escape uh, some immune cells? No, so what we saw is that there is no link between the viral titers and uh, the disease outcome, so it doesn't seem to be linked, and uh, there is uh, no correlation between the disease outcome and the viral clearance, though the, the, it was not significantly, statistically significant. I thought there was a tendency for symptomatic people to have a higher level, to maintain higher level of viral load, but this is not the case and it's not significant. So uh, I think it's, I was also very surprised 
surprised by the results because I was thinking that if you have persistence of the antigen, you may have higher inflammation, and so over time, uh, that would be bad. But I'm very surprised to see, and it makes sense actually, to see that maybe you get infected your immune response uh, doesn't pick it up. I don't know how it's regulated. It's because uh, maybe cell death, apoptosis mechanism, or whatever. Somehow the virus persists, but it's kind of maintained. Um, and eventually you get rid of it, and you don't develop symptoms. So for West Nile, I would say, good deal. It's not too bad, right? Now, the persistence in the case of, let's say that Zika would be the same as West Nile. In case of pregnancy, maybe allowing the virus to stay around or to disseminate faster or to reach the fetus early uh, is really bad. So it, it will be very interesting to compare the immune profile uh, in, in different groups uh, of pregnancy with different disease outcome after uh, infection in pregnancy. Okay, thank you very much, Marianne.